Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's a huge pleasure to be here again. I think I was here maybe five or six years ago, something like that. So great to be back and uh, great to have the opportunity to talk to you today about plant health. So I'm the Chief Plant Health Officer. What that means is I advise ministers in government and stakeholders, the public, about the risks posed by plant pests and diseases. Uh, and then also um, what we're going to do if we do get an outbreak of a pest or disease. So I manage the incident response if we get an outbreak uh, and mobilise the operational response to that. So quite a varied job, including sort of policy, science and operations. So just to set the scene, really, uh, obviously you're all here because you know plants are important. You're interested in plants. But it's really important that we understand the value of our plants and that we try and monetize that value. So this is where economists and statisticians uh, and other types of evidence come into play so that we can really understand what is the value at risk. And we've estimated that the value of plants and trees is around about 15.7 billion pounds a year. So that includes, uh, of course, the economic value of plants as crops, for example, but also the environmental value. Uh, how do we value our peat bogs, our woodlands, our trees uh, and other natural habitats? And also the social benefits of plants and trees, the health and well-being um, and uh, forestry amenity and all of these kind of things. So uh, the reason why we, it's really important we do this is because then we can make the case to seek investment to protect them. And the risks are growing. So this shows the cumulative increase in pest and disease outbreaks just of trees uh, over the last 50 or so years. So you can see since the 2000s, it has accelerated rapidly. And even in the last 12 months, we've seen um, one new disease arrive, Phytophthora pluvialis, uh, in the southwest. So this is driven by climate change, it's driven by globalisation, it's driven by the global movement of plants and plant products and also people. But actually it's not all about the plants, there are lots of other pathways by which pests and diseases can arrive. And the cost of outbreaks if things do arrive and become established is huge. So here's an example, the Asian longhorn beetle. We've had one outbreak of this in Kent in 2012. This was actually associated with slate that was imported from Asia. So the wood packaging material that the slates were packed with was the source of the longhorn beetle. So what happens is they've laid their eggs and pupated in the wood uh, in their native regions in Asia. The wood gets used to pack slates and plant pots and all sorts of things. They arrive, uh, they sit in a yard somewhere and then the um, adults emerge and then they seek out some hosts. It's got a very wide host range. Uh, lots of uh, broadleaf tree species are susceptible to Asian longhorn beetles. They fly, they lay their eggs, they establish and suddenly you've got an outbreak. So we found this um, and dealt with it very quickly. Of course, what becomes critical is the life cycle of the pest, so that you know that if you've got larvae in the, the wood, they are going to, you know, they'll pupate and then adults will emerge, they'll fly away and then they'll get more hosts. So we dealt with that quite quickly, but we had to fell 2,000 trees in that particular outbreak to make sure that we'd done the job properly. We used sniffer dogs that we borrowed from the Austrian plant health service that had been specifically trained to sniff out Asian longhorn beetle. And then we continued surveillance for five years to prove that we had eradicated that pest. So it can be done. We think it cost about two million pounds over that five years in the UK, but the outbreaks in the USA and other parts of Europe cost hundreds of millions. So this is very much one that, you know, we attempt to keep out by regulating not just the plants, but also the wood packaging material that can harbour them. And then, of course, sometimes diseases become endemic. 
So ash dieback is a good example. And I think you saw this earlier in the week and you only have to look around ash trees to see evidence of ash dieback. Um, it is established in the UK. It arrived uh, on a mixture of spores blowing over the channel from Europe and also imported trees. So getting to grips with the imported trees was relatively straightforward. We just banned them. But of course, we can't stop things blowing over the channel. It's been estimated that the cost will be around 15 billion over 100 years. A lot of those costs are associated with removing uh, dangerous trees uh, near rail networks or road networks uh, and the cost of doing that. If you've got to close a road to remove a dangerous ash tree, it's really, really expensive. Um, we've got um, some good news about ash dieback in terms of genetic tolerance. So the long term strategy for that is that we know that there are tolerant trees in the landscape. They will survive. They will reproduce. Ash trees, even if they've got ash dieback, we don't recommend felling them unless they're dangerous because they still contribute a huge amount to biodiversity uh, and ecosystem services. And then Phytophthora remorum, uh, a fungus like organism that is established uh, and has caused a lot of death to particularly larch trees. There's been a lot of proactive felling of larch trees. And indeed, uh, the rhododendron ponticum, which is an invasive species, is a very good vector for the spores. So that's also being proactively removed. But again, huge costs to the economy. And also um, in the landscapes where these trees have to be removed, it's quite devastating. Um, so they have to be replanted with something else. So it's always better to keep these things out. And what are the pathways for these things arriving? Well, obviously, things like produce and plants are the obvious pathways. This is one of our inspectors, Pauline, inspecting tomatoes. Uh, and then we have these kind of Danish trolleys loaded with plants. We check the paperwork. Have they got a plant passport or a phytosanitary certificate? And then we do physical checks based on risk. And then, of course, the demand for mature plants and trees. Uh, this is a typical you know, flatbed lorry loaded up with bare rooted trees that have been lifted um, and they're being moved around. Uh, and again, we have pre-notification and inspection. But it's very difficult to inspect these trees. They're so big. And of course, we're also interested in what's in the soil. Also, wood and wood products. Timber's very, very well regulated. Wood pallets are very well regulated. They have to conform to an international standard, which shows they've been heat treated. Also, the wood is narrow enough so that wood boring beetles like the Asian longhorn beetle can't lay their eggs and pupate in them. So we do a lot of inspections on this material. Uh, but what about vehicles? You wouldn't have thought they were a pathway for plant pests and diseases, but they are. We move a lot of used machinery and vehicles around uh, and this pest here the brown marmorated stink bug loves to hide away in a vehicle uh, nice and warm and cozy and then it pops out at the other end and it becomes established either as a plant pest or a nuisance pest uh, and these stink bugs do exactly that they stink the place out so very undesirable we have regulations about used farm machinery it's got to be clean uh, but of course, we're moving around huge amounts of vehicles and equipment. And then, of course, direct sales and postal services have grown enormously. This has driven uh, a huge increase in the trade of plants and plant products. And just here's an example of some consignments we intercepted um, in March 2020. Uh, there were 1,200 of these individual boxes. Each contained a bare-rooted fruit tree destined for private individuals. They'd ordered them online. They were expecting their apple tree to arrive in the post. Sorry, no. These uh, were all non-compliant. There was no phytosanitary certification, no evidence that they'd been uh, inspected or tested or uh, gone through any official controls. So they were all re-exported back to where they came from. And of course, the customers were very disappointed. Uh, but they probably bought those trees in good faith, thinking, well, if it's on the internet 
uh, then it should be fine. And obviously the responsibility of the exporter is to make sure that those plants are properly tested, checked, certified so that they can be moved safely. And then uh, this is an example of a member of the public who was sitting one day in their conservatory and suddenly this very alarming exotic beetle um, started flying around their conservatory. They didn't know what it was. Thankfully they took a photograph and captured it uh, and were sensible enough to contact their local council pest control. They didn't know what it was um, and uh, eventually a plant health inspector got involved to investigate because they recognised that it was some kind of exotic uh, plant pest. We traced it back to a chair that had been bought on eBay. The origin of the chair was China. And when our inspectors, with permission from the owners, dismantled the back of the chair, you could see very clearly not only an exit hole from where that adult beetle had emerged, but there is a huge um, pupa in that chair. So um, clearly the wood had been taken from an infested source. The larvae were already present in the wood. They've probably been in there a long time, maybe several years. Uh, this pest completes its life cycle over many years uh, outside its natural range. Uh, and then we I managed to identify it um, uh, as a soya beetle. So we do get these reports from time to time. Uh, they sometimes cause alarm. Uh, in this example, this uh, couple were convinced they had a haunted sofa because they were sitting at night, you know, watching television, hearing a bit of a scratching noise. They, they looked everywhere. They thought it was in the roof, in the floorboards. They got somebody from the local church to come and exercise the sofa. Uh, and again, um, somehow a plant health inspector uh, realised and got involved and realised it was an infestation of Asian longhorn beetle and the sofa was riddled with um, exit holes and larvae and pupae. So there you go. And then this is an example of where a work of art becomes a risk. I don't know if anyone recognises this. This is a work of art by uh, the uh, Chinese exiled artist Ai Weiwei. Uh, it was at the Royal Academy in London a few years ago. I happened to be at the Linnaean Society next door uh, going to a meeting and of course you know you can't stop me being curious particularly where I see bits of wood lying around. Uh, so I went and had a look, took some photographs of of course exit holes of Asian longhorn beetles. So I got in touch with my colleagues in Forestry Commission and said we're going to have to investigate this um, and um, sure enough, the whole exhibit had exit holes. So we weren't sure, were they historic? Were they new? Was there any chance that this work of art um, had Asian longhorn beetles in it? It was December, so the risk was low that they were going to emerge. But nevertheless, uh, we liaised with the Royal Academy. We issued them with a statutory plant health notice uh, and we agreed with them that we would um, allow fumigation of the whole exhibit. So the whole thing was dismantled and fumigated. It was a really challenging decision. Actually, I could have asked for it to all be destroyed um, and burned. Uh, it was very sensitive because this is a work of art. It's a, a politically sensitive, sensitive artist. Uh, we, so we looked at the risk assessment uh, and decided that fumigation would be the best course of action. This exhibit was on its way all over the world. Uh, to be exhibited in other countries. So I think that was the right course of action. But it was, you know, a quite a tense few weeks while we decided what to do with that. Even sports venues can be a challenge. Um, if any of you are sports uh, enthusiasts, you'll know what these venues look like. They're amazing. The turf is pristine. It's heated. It's watered. It is the perfect location for infestations because you've got this closed system, uh, nurtured, fed, watered and warmed. So what we found a few years ago in some premiership um, sports venues was um, a quarantine nematode, Meloidigyne, um, and um, again it was what's the best course of action here? 
we looked at the whole risk assessment. Actually, the risk was not so much on the pitch because the pitch only really had access to officials and players. Their boots are all cleaned. But what happens when the pitch is replaced is that soil all gets taken off and dumped on agricultural land. So actually the risk was that the crops that might be grown on that land would then become infested with this uh, quarantine nematode. So we worked with these uh, premiership football clubs, particularly on a biosecurity protocol, and agreed that when they removed the soil, it had to go to deep burial and so on. And now they've got much better processes in place to reduce the risk of introducing. But this was going on really at the, at the height of the premier football season. There was the, um, the derby going on in Manchester, Man City versus Man U we've got a quarantine nematode in the turf. So it all becomes, again, quite a sort of complex set of decisions. But uh, again, good outcomes and now much improved um, biosecurity behaviour across the whole of the kind of sports turf sector. And of course, garden programmes. I don't know if, if any of you watch garden programmes. I'm an avid watcher of Gardener's World and listen to Gardener's Question Time because they're always recommending things. And of course, I know that will drive a trend. It will drive purchasing behaviour. It will drive a demand for some plants that we'd rather it, uh, weren't sort of being desired and imported. Uh, and Monty Don here, who's a, a very sort of well-known garden uh, presenter on, on one particular occasion was advocating planting olive trees uh, in his garden at Long Meadow. So of course uh, the alarm bells ring because olive is a high risk host for Xylella fastidiosa, a very significant pest in Europe and globally. Uh, and suddenly we know that everyone's going to be going to the garden centre wanting an olive tree. So uh, our job was to then kind of work with the programme and to work with public messages about um, you have to be careful where you source your plants from, make sure it's a reliable source, that everything has been imported correctly and has the right sort of phytosanitary certification and so on. And even food can drive behaviour. Um, this, these are all sort of examples of South American food. I don't know if we've got anyone from the region, but you might recognise uh, down the bottom there in the middle, uh, we've got uluco uh, and then we've got ochre. And these are you know, exotic vegetables. They're very attractive. It drives demand. And we discovered a couple of years ago um, uluco being traded on the internet in the UK. Somebody was growing it, selling it, um, you know, people creating dishes with it uh, and um, we became concerned because this was not something that this wasn't a trade that we were aware of so we did investigate and went to visit the um, the plants growing in the field oh dear riddled with viruses um, at least 10 um, and new to science I think you all um, worked earlier in the week with Charles Lane from Ferrer so our Ferrer scientists um, the virologist, I'm a plant virologist, so I know how excited you can get about finding new viruses. He was very excited because he found about 10. And that Im information immediately came back to me as uh, uh, the lead on policy and regulation. And we quickly put in place legislation to prohibit import of Ulico. It primarily comes from uh, Peru. Uh, because of this concern about the viruses which can infect potatoes. So that was another example of an un unintended importation of a plant um, and then discovering that there were major problems with it. Unsolicited seeds started arriving a couple of years ago in small packets, thousands and thousands of them. And again, we investigated this to try and work out uh, what was going on. Um, it turned out to be a brushing scam um, whereby people send very low value products marked earrings or jewellery. It turned out it was very poor quality seed as a way of boosting their um, ratings on internet platforms. Um, so we investigated um, thousands of these samples. But there wasn't really a biosecurity threat because they were all sort of low quality uh, nothing sinister in there, but it just shows that if somebody decided to send seeds all over the world, um, they can. So, um, in terms of 
the way things work in the UK. We have a UK plant health regime. We come under WTO and International Plant Protection um, Convention uh, sort of rules. And within the UK, I lead uh, for DEFRA, but we have uh, devolved competencies. So plant health is devolved in uh, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. And then we have a whole range of organisations such as FERA, Forestry Commission, Q, etc., that deliver services um, and sort of scientific diagnostics and uh, a testing and, and inspection, etc. And our mm. aim is to provide this biosecurity continuum right across our territory. So from pre-border, before things leave countries, providing assurance that they're not infested, uh, controls at the border and following up in country. So we focus our attention in these three areas, really, um, in countries of origin, um, around our borders and import controls and um, doing inspections on the ground. So this all starts with horizon scanning, looking globally to see what are the new and emerging threats, uh, what can we pick up uh, through internet intelligence about you know, who's selling Ulico, for example. Um, and then we generate um, um, a sort of whole programme of work looking at some of these new threats. Um, and we have developed a UK plant health risk register, which helps us prioritise these threats. So the way we do this is we take a given threat, we might do a pest risk analysis on it, and then we'll look at what is the likelihood, impact and value if that pest were to arrive. Um, and then we, we give it a number and we give it a code. So the, the largest number that any pest can get is 125. Uh, and then we grade these threats. The highest risk ones over 60 are in the red category and so on. So this helps us prioritise threats. We've got about 1,200 threats on the risk register. You can search for it. You can download it. You can um, inter interrogate it. Uh, to find out about uh, a host you're interested in or a pest. So, for example, potato ring rot's one of the highest threats. So the unmitigated risk rating is 125. That's as big as it can get. But by carrying out mitigations, for example, we regulate it. We've got certification schemes. We've got research um, and um, we carry out surveillance. We can actually bring the residual risk right down to 40. It's still in the yellow category, but it just shows that where things are very risky, there are some things we can do. Uh, in other cases, it's more difficult. And then if you look at the threats through these different sort of commodities um, in forestry, we've got, um, you know, things like xylella as a major threat um, and all the way through to kind of fruit trees and greenhouse crops. So, you know, we know exactly how many threats there are in each of these sectors and we work closely with industry to help manage those. And then in terms of import controls, uh, at the moment we're not doing inspections at borders for EU material. We do do it for the rest of the world. Uh, we've got point of destination checks and we'll be moving to border controls uh, later on. But we do, you know, tens of thousands of checks, physical checks, documentary and ID checks, inspections uh, and wider surveillance. So we fly helicopters with the Forestry Commission over our treescape. That helps us pick up intelligence about the health of the tree canopy. And then we can send somebody in on the ground to look at what's going on. We use satellites uh, and sort of increasingly... Um, other sort of drone and aerial technologies to do our surveillance. We do get outbreaks. We're currently dealing with an outbreak of this um, eight-toothed spruce bark beetle, Ips typographus. Uh, this simply flies over the channel. So we found it first in Kent. So it's primarily been found in Kent and East Sussex. This is the area uh, where we've been finding outbreaks. These blue dots here are where we've got traps pheromone traps just to uh, check it hasn't gone any further. We had 13 outbreaks last year. They've all been eradicated. We've got new ones this year. So, you know, we're really having to step up our game in terms of um, future protection from this pest, given it gets here all by itself. 
doing lots of research and molecular and isotope testing to work out where these populations are coming from. But this is a, a really an ongoing problem for the team. And then Phytophthora pluvialis, we only found this in October last year as a result of aerial surveillance. So this is a fungus-like pathogen. It's affecting um, western hemlock and Douglas fir. And really, we're at the stage where we're getting you know, lots and lots of data and information about this. We're doing surveys. We found it in a few other sites up the west coast of the UK, which is exactly where you would find a Phytophthora. Uh, so um, ongoing surveillance. The only other two places in the world this has been found are New Zealand and the USA. So we're collaborating with them to try and understand how big a threat is this? Is it um, limited or is it going to have the potential to spread? And then I mentioned ash dieback earlier. So where we do have uh, long-term um, problems, we mitigate the, their impact. So for ash dieback, we have an archive of ash trees which are tolerant, the Living Ash Project with Future Trees Trust. So these will become the tolerant trees for the future. We've been doing a lot of work on bacterial diseases to mitigate xylella, particularly with BBSRC Bacterial Diseases Program. And um, last year we released a um, non-native parasitic wasp, Torimus sinensis, as a means of biological control for another pest, the oriental chestnut gall wasp. So we're, we're, we released it last year, we've done it again this year, we're gathering data. We think that might be quite a good uh, solution for long-term management of, of this tree pest. And then also we're investing heavily in genomics, genetics. We have an ash tree map. We are now working on a full oak tree map and even this week I was at Kew two days ago talking about the elm tree and the future of elm in the landscape. So we're now funding work through the Centre for Forest Protection on um, a, a full elm map so that we can understand uh, the genetic basis of disease resistance, tolerance and susceptibility. So I think that's, that's all really exciting work and it will help unravel the secrets of our trees. And looking ahead to the future, these three threats uh, are top of our agenda. Uh, xylella, I've mentioned. The emerald ash borer, this particularly, um, if you're an entomologist, I'm sure you think that's rather gorgeous. It's a jewel beetle, uh, but it's absolutely deadly. So if the trees have got ash dieback, imagine if they became infested with the emerald ash borer. It would kill them very quickly. Uh, so uh, the principal pathway for that is firewood um, so that pathway is very very tightly regulated and plain wilt which is a fungus disease affecting plane trees uh, throughout other parts of Europe uh, plane trees are very important in the urban environment so again uh, regulations for all of these three to keep them out just to sort of show you where xylella has got to in Europe um, there are outbreaks um, throughout France, Spain, Italy, the Balearics. The biggest issues really are in the heel of Italy, uh, Corsica and the Balearics, where they affect things like olive trees, almond trees. They, it has devastated olive production in the Puglia region of Italy. Um, they also, this bacteria infests more than 600 other species. So, um, you know, it is polyphagous uh, and one to keep out. We've invested a lot in research on this particular bacterial pathogen through the Bridget project led by the John Innes Centre. Lots of awareness raising uh, and working with um, the public and industry to, to make sure that they're very vigilant. We invest in science and education. So we work closely with the Gatsby programme, working on education, uh, developing master's programs, for example, uh, and also undergraduate projects. So the, the FUGS project is particularly successful. We've run it, I think, for five years, five or six years. We offer undergraduate uh, internships, which are paid, uh, and it's a competitive process. So we've just finished this year's round. Look out for that next year if you're interested. Uh, you get to work um, on a plant health project at an institute or university uh, for three months uh, and it's uh, well paid. 
uh, investing in research projects as well, which I think I've already mentioned. And then we also use the public, the citizen science. Um, this morning I was at the Yorkshire Arboretum for a meeting there and I bumped into some of our observatory volunteers. So these are members of the public who volunteer as experts to do surveillance on tree pests and diseases. So they were all getting some training this morning. So great to see them. They're all over the UK and every single one of these dots is a report by one of our volunteers. Uh, the red ones is where they found something. Uh, the green ones is, uh, is the all clear, something that they've reported, but it's actually uh, not, not a problem. And they're trained to spot all of these beasts. So really, really helpful for us to have these people on the ground, their eyes, um, because they know the, the place they live. They know if there's something happening, something's changed. So it's really, really helpful. And then um, if you see anything that you're, you think might be um, you know, a tree health problem, you can report it as well via Tree Alert. I was just on holiday in Scotland a couple of weeks ago and you know, I simply can't help myself. I spotted a really um, sort of stressed, disease looking conifer and I thought, oh gosh, could that be pluvialis? So I took a picture, uploaded it to Tree Alert with the... Um, geographic position so somebody at forest research will be taking a look at that so uh, i think it's really good when you see something that you're concerned about that there is a way that you can report it uh, and then we also do lots of public awareness we were at chelsea this year and this is my team of uh, afro inspectors and rhs uh, plant health people they go around chelsea uh, in the build and they look at everything they check for compliance, anything that's prohibited. We found some illegal lavenders there, so we dealt with them. So that gives the RHS a lot of assurance that the, um, that the show is safe. And then we had an exhibit here, Don't Risk It. This is my colleague Lucy Carson-Taylor, and we won a gold medal. Uh, and we had lots and lots of public interest, lots of celebrities came to talk to us. Uh, and um, it's a really, really good way of getting the message out there. Uh, so all this information is available on the UK Plant Health Portal, if you want to have a look there. Uh, the, also, you can access the uh, risk register through the portal. Uh, and this year, we're going to be launching a new strategy. We've been working on this for a couple of years. Um, we're just finishing and finalising the document, uh, and we'll launch it in the autumn. Uh, and we have four outcomes, a world-class biosecurity regime, a society that values healthy plants, a biosecure supply chain, and an enhanced technical capability. So look out for that. And finally, in September, we are having an international plant health conference in London um, in collaboration with the Food and Agriculture Organization, which is the United Nations um, Food and, uh, Organization and the International Plant Protection Convention. So that's in September 21 to the 23rd at the uh, Queen Elizabeth Centre in London. And the themes are food security, environmental protection and safe trade. So I think that's me. I'm on Twitter if you want to give me a follow and thank you very much for your attention.